Hey everyone and welcome to Housing and Interior Design. We're going to start with the first lesson, which is going to be looking at the historical architectural um, interior or exteriors of homes. So we're going to start back as far back as we can go, which is um, looking at the indigenous and English settlements. Um, and we're going to break this up into the next couple of weeks and kind of take apart the indigenous to English, uh, French, German, Spanish, Swedish, um, and then up into modern day. So let's take a look at the ind indigenous and um, English settlements. So what we're going to start with is that we know that each tribe developed a distinct way of life. Um, environment and culture were the two main influences on the type of housing developed by each tribe. They wanted to make sure that their homes had to be made out of resources that they found in nature, um, and then that it also still respected their cultural beliefs. The environment determined which building materials were available and then the type of protection from the elements that was needed. When we sit here and talk about the elements, we're literally talking about the weather. So if they lived a little bit um, northern, it was going to be colder. If they lived more southern, it's going to be warmer. Um, and then also what they were using is they had to make sure that um, they had to be able to pack up and move on uh, whenever the time called for it. Because we know that um, one of their considerations for building their homes um, was the methods of obtaining food. Um, the early indigenous tribes were nomadics, which means that they traveled. They had to move where their food moved. So they had to make sure that they were able to pack up and ready to go and that whatever their homes were made of, they were able to carry with them. Um, other co cultural considerations were the social organization, religious beliefs, and then the size of the group or family, the group family or organization. So even though that um, each indigenous tribe was different from each other, a lot of their homes did have some common characteristics. We know that their homes had dirt floors. Um, the reason being that it'd be another piece of material that they would have to carry. So you just made sure that you found a ground that kind of worked for you. Um, and they, you know, would kind of clear it out and then they would have just dirt floors. Um, they typically didn't have windows. Uh, no chimneys. They were also dark and overcrowded. So it would typically be more than one family that would live in one or if they only had one structure, one dwelling, um, a larger family would live in there. So there were no rooms or anything like that. Everything was one large room. Um, because as you, you guys can see this example, this is what we call a wigwam here. Um, and it's one of the dwellings that was created. But if they, if you guys can kind of see, it's all made out of tree bark. So they wouldn't necessarily want to put their fire inside of it because there is no window, no chimney. So all the smoke would just go straight up. But then also it's made out of bark. So it's going to easily catch on fire. So more than likely their fire was somewhere out here towards the center. Um, so they could still get the warmth of it without the smoke inhalation and then the potential for it to burn down. Uh, the other kind of more native um, dwelling that was really common to the Easter woodlands would also be teepees. Um, they would use a long skinny uh, trees and then they would use the hides from um, the animals that they hunted and they would create um, their teepees. Uh, and like I said, both housing structures that typically housed one to two families, um, there wasn't a lot of room. So we talked about the indigenous um, peoples being nomadic, meaning they traveled a lot. Well, eventually um, they learned some farming techniques and that's what kept them um, to build more permanent settlements. So because they were building more permanent settlements, they were able to invest in kind of more than um, resources that were around them and purposely make them um, withstand the elements longer. So they built these permanent structures called pueblos which is what all these are here. Kind of think of them as the early um, apartments, so to speak. So if you can kind of see some of these stairs up here, these ladders, that would be going to another um, entrance to like another living situation. So pueblos were built on top of each other. Um, they were also sometimes built into cliffs and caves um, and then also on the level ground. So they would use the cliffs and caves as part of their kind of protection and their barriers. Uh, in order to build these, they would use uh, clay that they dried out um, using sun, using the sun, um, and we'd call those adobe clay. Uh, but they were just bricks that they would shape, form, and then let them dry out completely and then build them on top of each other. So literally, it's the kind of earliest forms of construction that we see, and we use some of those techniques still today. 
So the early American periods from 1640 to 1720, where we had an influx of a lot of settlers come over here to the to the Americas. Um, and so the first one that we're going to take a look at is the English. So the English first settled um, in Jamestown, Virginia and Plymouth, Massachusetts. So between 1640 and 1720, um, smaller settlements eventually started expanding into much busier towns. Um, and so because of that, they started building, of course, more permanent housing structures, um, and they used a lot of influences from their own cultures. So they would bring that over here, which is why we have such a um, array of different types of housing styles, because these were skills that they knew that they brought with them. So more permanent homes started to grow. More uh, Some of the earlier popular ones were what we called half-timbered houses. And guys, I want you to keep in mind, too, when we talk about these early settlements, that all these pictures are modern-day pictures, because um, obviously the camera wasn't around um, to take permanent photographs. So, of course, you can see in here that these are more modern-day um, and things like that. But half-timbered houses um, was this style right here. So it's the wood framing. These are actually beams that are used to support the different types of frames. Um, and then what they would do is they would fill it in between it. They'd fill it with like brick or plaster, um, which is still the technique that we see here. So you actually see this exposed beams and then this is all plaster built in there. So nowadays we know what as we would build a frame like this, but then we'd put drywall on one side, we'd put insulation between it, and then we'd put drywall on the other side, kind of like making a sandwich. And then we'd paint it and you wouldn't see any of it. That wasn't the case with these half timbered homes. Um, the kind of way to remember it is um, timbered is a fancy word for wood. So you saw the wood beams. Um, and then a lot of times too, their roofs would have um, thatching on it, which would be bundles of reeds or straw. They wouldn't have shingles like we see here. Um, but these the thatch would be bundled together and then laid on top of each other. So the English also brought um, a style that's very popular um, that is still actually popular today and actually a couple of them over by the school are this style. Um, we have the Cape Cod house, which is a house with a simple rectangular design, a central roof, or I'm sorry, a central chimney, and then a pitched roof. So literally you had a big old rectangle, uh, rectangular shape. You would put a kitchen, a dining room, and then a bedroom or two in there. Um, and this is still, again, modern day. Um, and this is still very popular. These are really great and they're known as like starter homes for young couples that are just kind of starting out. Maybe they don't have kids just yet and they'll eventually move on to a larger house. Or these are also great as retirement homes for older people who um, still want to live in a house and live on their own, but it's not too big that they can't take care of it and, and keep up with it. So these are really great Um and and so still popular uh the pitched roof is when the roof forms triangular ends um walls on each side so this one we're actually seeing the front of it and the triangle would be right over here this is the another example of the gable roof is down below um so we talk about the pitched roof area we're literally and sorry that keeps popping up guys but what we're looking at is what is red is the actual front of the house and then the gray part is um, when the roof forms the triangular ends. So um, on this one, you can kind of see if we were to put a front door like down over in this section right there. So another type of um, housing structure is after a while that we saw that families were expanding, um, we had to start building onto our homes instead of just saying, okay, this house was great. Let's go build another one that wasn't really logical at the time. So they would add extensions to the houses. So one of the popular extensions was called an L. Um, basically what they did is they built right angles to the length of the structure. So right in here would be the original home. And in fact, um, you would also end up seeing down here would be the door. So this would be the original home right here. The family's expanding. They're going to add more house here and more house here. So if you look at it, it kind of looks like the letter L. So this is just a, um, a top view of it um, that when you would originally, oops, sorry guys, when you would look at it, you would have your main door down there, your chimney is still off to the side right here, and then you'd walk into the other rooms, and there you go. So again, looks like the letter L. The next one that we're going to talk about is called a gambrel roof, and I've got examples on the next slide. That's when two slopes on each side, um, the upper slope being flatter than the lower slope. So I want you to think about the old school barns, the big bright red barns with the white doors. Um, and that's what this is talking about right here. So again, this is pretty flat, so it's not as steep. And then right here, you have a pretty steep drop in it. Um, and this is what we call the gambrel roof. Down here, 
um, is a view of what it actually looks like because you kind of see this and you're like, oh, that's a big barn. But they can actually make it kind of with a barn type influence without it being too much of a country theme to it. So this is the one from, if you put the front door again on the side right here, there's also um, examples of this house where you can put the door right here and then this would be the front side of it. And it does look a bit more boxy. Over here it looks a bit more open. So the next style that we're gonna look at, it's called a salt box. That's a two story pitched roof. So again, it's a roof that looks like that. Um, in which the rear portion of the roof extends down to cover first floor addition. So the L is an extension, that's an addition, and then the salt box um, also covers that as well. This is a salt box right here. So originally the house was built um, about, I would probably say about right here, if not um, kind of near this area right here. This was the original house, and then they added this on. So instead of adding it like a big L that juts out this way, they actually just ran it along the length of the normal house. And then they added this roof up here that originally was a pitched roof or a gable roof. And then they extended it down. One way I like to kind of remember this is the salt box has what I like to call the mullet roof. So it looks like a mullet haircut. It's got, sh it's short in the front and it's longer in the back and extends it down. And then that addition again runs the whole length of it. The last example that we're going to look at, it's called the garrison. Um, this is when the second story overhangs from the first story. So if you look down here, um, it kind of looks like you somebody went to go pick up the house, realized there was a house inside of it that started falling down, and then they just restacked it. So that's kind of what this is right here. This is the part that they say overhangs that section. Um, there's really no big reason for that other than that was just popular at the time. That was just one of the multitude of design styles that was brought over. We still see some of this today. It's not um, as prominent. This overhanging part is not as prominent. It's a little bit quieter. Um, and then it's sometimes mixed in with some other styles that we're going to learn about later. And that's what you need to know about the um, early settlements and then the original indigenous people being here and, and kind of all these housing symbols uh, or housing styles um, started meshing together. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Mm -hmm.